Hey y'all, welcome to The Road You Leave Behind. It's a very special episode this time with country music icon Travis Tritt. Has a brand new record coming out May 7th called Set in Stone and it is fantastic. Travis sent me a little bit of a preview of the record about a month ago. I have been listening, listening to it constantly. And I went down to Travis's ranch in Georgia a couple months back went and spent an entire day with him and his family, hanging out, talking about his path to Nashville, what obstacles he faced, and what it was like when he faced criticism, and the individuals, speaking of icons, who helped him through that uncertain time with some insecurity in his career when he felt like he was doing the right thing because it was true to him and who he wanted to be but it wasn't especially well received in Nashville. Quite a conversation with someone who's very important to me, someone I admire, and someone whose catalog provided a substantial part of the soundtrack of my youth. So without further ado, here on The Road You Leave Behind on Outsider, here is Travis Tripp. It is not every day that I have the opportunity to sit with royalty but today i get the opportunity to sit with an absolute legend first of all thank you so much travis for having us out here to your property we're in travis's home studio here in in georgia and i want to just start with this space like what are you doing here record music in here yeah i uh, this is kind of i wanted a writer's studio Mm -hmm. and uh years ago when i was working on an album with randy jackson he had a little set up very similar to this same speakers same everything and it's just a place where if you come up with a song idea and you want to just kind of like do a little quick demo i mean this is not where we would record anything for an album but to come in and just be able to sit down real quick and you know plug and play and get an idea down on 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 tape uh, get it recorded that's uh, that's very beneficial to me. So that's basically what, what this space was built for. When we finished that album, we actually mixed the album. I would sit right here in, in front of this console, and we had a download, a simulcast download of the music. So Randy was listening to exactly the same thing I was listening to as we were mixing. And we would make notes together back and forth and say, I think this needs to come up or down or this needs to be changed. And we actually mixed the whole. He was in Los Angeles. I was here. in L.A.? Yeah, he was in L.A. And I was here. And we mixed that entire album that way. Everybody knows Randy from American Idol fame. Oh, yes. What was it like cutting a record with him? He was great, man. Actually, the way we met, uh, he was uh, producing an album on Sam Moore from Sam and Dave fame. And he asked me, Sam asked me if I would come in and do a, a song with him on the album. And so I came in and um, Randy Jackson, uh, I think, was kind of surprised at the fact that I had so much of that R&B, rhythm and blues background in, uh, in my influences. And he, he said, man, when I came out of the vocal booth, he said, man, he said, I've been a fan of yours for years, but he said, I had no idea that you had all that. He called it blue-eyed soul. Yeah. He said, that blue-eyed soul thing, man. He said, I had no idea. He said, if you ever decided that you wanted to do a record that just featured that, he said, I'd love to produce it for you. And that's how it happened. That's so cool. As I look around this room, I see influences everywhere. You're talking oh, yeah. about influences. You know, you and I have talked about Dale in the past. We'll get to that in a minute. I see Charlie Daniels right there. I see Waylon and Jesse Coulter over there. Who were some of those influences that kind of shaped that sound? Those were some of the biggest ones. Um, I grew up listening to uh, WSB radio here in in Metro Atlanta. And back in those days, back in the 60s and early 70s, they played everything. I mean, in the morning before I was getting ready to go to school, they played, they might play a Hank Williams song, followed by a Frank Sinatra song, followed by an Elvis song. Uh, it was just all over the place. And so that's, that's where the early influences came from. The only one that's not pictured in this room 
that probably had more to do with anything that comes out of my mouth when I sing is Ray Charles. Mm. He was one of those. I, I remember hearing modern sounds of country and western music when I was just a kid. And the first time I heard one of those songs done that way, we were actually in our car. Uh, my dad had an old uh, uh, 63 Bonneville Pontiac. Sweet. And uh, I was sitting in the back and it came on the radio. And I don't know how old I was, maybe four, five, something like that. But I couldn't wait to get back home to get in front of my mirror with my pencil, <laughs> which was my microphone, <laughs> and see if I could sing like that. Because instead of, you know, uh, I can't stop loving you. He would say, I can't yeah. stop loving you. And put all those bends and all that was curls and things in there. And I thought, man, this is so cool. And I couldn't wait to get home and see if I could sing like that. And as it turned out, I never did it as good as Ray did, but that's that was one of the biggest influences. That's so interesting, because that is a very iconic piece of your vocal ability, oh. is that that depth, I guess, is the right term. I'm yeah, not I, a I, musical I, expert by any stretch, but well, it's that, that, yeah, you're doing, not doing too bad. <laughs> that, 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 like, richness of the yes. delivery, is that the right that's way? That's soul, I think, soul, yeah. you know, being able to just, you know, instead of just singing straight on the note, being able to slide up and down it. I mean, I don't know why Ray Charles shocked me so much with that because if you go back now and listen to like George Jones, early George Jones stuff, or even Merle Haggard, I mean, those guys, they were doing all those curls and stuff too. But I just heard it. I just heard that type of music in a totally different way. It was like an epiphany for me. It was just like opened it up to so many other things. And then from there, obviously, um, that was always my center, my core. But then later on, I started listening in the 70s, you know, Skinner, mm -hmm. the Allman Brothers, Marshall Tucker Band, Charlie Daniels, obviously. Um, I just loved all that music. And then, of course, you know, the Eagles, um, Boston, all that stuff, I mean, it, it all just, Aerosmith, it just all came into, into play. And then take that and the bluegrass festivals that I went to when I was very young with my uncle. Um, we went to bluegrass festivals all over the southeast and, and um, just getting a chance to not only hear that music, but, but after the shows were over, everybody would go back to the campground and get in front of a campfire yeah. and sit around and pick. Awesome. And, you know, it's just it was just all of that together, all of those different facets with a little bit of southern gospel sprinkled over the top of it, and that's pretty much what I am. You mentioned the Eagles. Yeah. For people watching and listening, y'all may not know. <coughs> this man put the Eagles back together. <laughs> what what was that experience like when you you had the desire in your soul to sing one of their most iconic songs? What transpired? to put them back together. First of all, I don't take any credit. But he should. <laughs> I don't take any credit for bringing the Eagles back together because the way that all came down, um, they wanted to produce a record out of Nashville with all these different country artists. It's called Common Thread. Oh, yeah. Songs of the Eagles. And um, they wanted to have all these country music artists. This is back in the 90s. They wanted to have all these different country music artists singing Eagles songs. And I was one of the last people that was invited to be a part of that album. Um, I remember when, when they called me and asked me about doing it, I said, well, yeah, you know. And they said, well, what song do you want to do? Well, I'd like to do Desperado. Uh, no, Clint Black's already got that one. Yeah. All right, I'd like to do this one, or I'd like to do that one. No, this one's already got somebody's. All the songs that I wanted to do were spoken for. So after a while, I just kind of said, well, what's left? And my attorney in Nashville said, why don't you do Take It Easy? And he said, that was their first number one. So why don't you do that? I said, okay, well, yeah, sure. So I went in and did the song. And a few weeks later, they sent me an advanced copy of the album. And I just sat and listened to it and thought it was just fabulous. Everybody, Everybody's performances were just, I thought, off the charts. 
And then I got the surprise phone call from Irving Azoff's office. Um, they said, we want yours to be the first single off this album. And we, to promote it, we want to do a video. What concept would you like to do for the video? And I'm on the phone call and I'm shocked and honored by this offer. But at the same time, I have no idea what to do for a video. All I know is, if you're going to do, have a video, it's got to be something pretty darn special, right? So off the top of my head, without even thinking about it, I said, hell, I don't know. Let's get the Eagles back together. And it was dead silent on the <laughs> other end of the phone. And I had really no idea about all of the turmoil that had gone on inside the band um, between all certain different members. Um, and I had no idea about the comments that were made about when do you think the Eagles are going to get back together. And I think it was Don Henley said, when hell freezes over. Yep. So I had no concept of any of that. Ignorance is bliss. It is. God bless it. <laughs> I know. So, I got a lot of it. <laughs> so I, I, I made that comment. And a few days later, we got a call from uh, Irving's office. And he said, look. I'm going to leave this up to you. If you can get Don Henley or Glenn Fry both to agree to do this project, but you're going to have to call them and you're going to have to ask them. So we got on the phone and we called Glenn Fry first. And Glenn said, to my surprise, he said, you know, I would be open to that. He said, because this is not about the Eagles, really. This is about the great performances that you guys did and all of you guys in country music did as sort of a tribute to the music that we did. So he said, if Don will do it, I'll do it. So then we called Don Henley and I didn't tell, we didn't tell Don Henley that we'd already talked to Glenn Fry. Smart man. <laughs> right? You were first, Don. <laughs> Absolutely. We're coming <laughs> to you first. And he said pretty much the same thing. So... We got those guys to agree to do the video, and we shot it. It was in December, right before Christmas, and we shot it in a little cantina in Los Angeles. And, I mean, most of the video, if you go back and look at it, most of it is, you know, us shooting pool or walking down an alleyway or just kind of hanging out in that bar. But at the end of the video, they had a bandstand set up and it, they had all the live amps and all the drum kits and everything set up. And they said, we want to get you guys playing the song, just, you know, pre playing, pretending like you're playing to the track. So all the amps were live. So I grab a guitar and I go up and I start playing that opening lick for Rocky Mountain Way. Bam, da, bam, da, bam, da, bam, da, And Joe Walsh and I ended up sharing the same microphone and the first time that the Eagles had played together in 14 years, I got to be an Eagle for a day. And it was just a thrill. Unbelievable. That's the baddest ass thing ever. <laughs> See, you put them back together, man. Well, I don't know about then that. Then they went and toured after that. They did. They did. Actually, the Hell Freezes Over tour started the next, the following year. That's just so neat. Yeah. That is so cool. When did music become a mission? I always had the desire for it when I was young because um, I grew up singing in church. Um, but my father was adamantly opposed to it. Why? He grew up in the Depression era where he, if he said this to me once, he said it to me a million times. Uh, he told my mother, who was taking me to church every Sunday and every Wednesday, she, he, he said, uh, you're going to ruin that boy because everybody that he'd ever seen in his lifetime that played music, they were either a drunk or a drug addict or too lazy to work. And he did, did not, he saw it as that. He saw it as, you know, why don't you go out and get you a real job, that kind of thing. So I was always very hesitant about I had the desire to do it when I was probably six years old, but I always kind of kept that hidden except when I was in church. 
And uh, finally, you know, I graduated from high school and got married and went out and got a regular job and like everybody wanted me to. What'd you do? I did. A, I worked for a heating and air conditioning wholesale company. What sell ACs? I started out loading trucks mm. on the dock, and within uh, about a little less than a year, I had worked my way up to managing the store. So, uh, the guy that was my man, that was the vice president of uh, the wholesale company, dealer supply company in Marietta, Georgia. Um, he was a musician also. He was a guitar player. As a matter of fact, he had gotten an offer at one point when he was very young to uh, play on the road with Carlos Santana. And he turned that down because his family had owned the business and it was, you know, one of those family things they passed down. And he always regretted it. He, uh, he looked back and said, he told me, he said, man, he said, you know, that's one of the things... I'll sit, <clears throat> if I live to be 80, I'll sit in my rocking chair and wonder whether or not I could have made it in that business. So I started playing little local nightclubs and places like that. I was working my day job. I had to be there every morning to open up at 7. And we closed at 6 p.m. every night. So I would leave there, go home, grab a shower, and had to play my gig Monday through Saturday from 8 p.m. till 2 a.m., 3 a.m. on Saturday. Monday through Saturday. And I did that for months, and it nearly killed me. But I was young, and, you know, I can handle it. So after a while, I started realizing that I was, A, having a whole hell of a lot more fun <laughs> at my night job sure. than I was at my day job, and, B, oddly enough, I was making more money on my night job than I was on my day job. So I went back to him and I said, listen, I'm thinking about really trying to pursue this because if I don't do it now, I'll never know. And he encouraged me uh, because he had passed up that opportunity with Carlos Santana and he encouraged me. He said, look, go out, do it, try it. And if it doesn't work, your job here is always safe. You've got something to fall back on. So I did and I never looked back. How do honky tonks and bars and play in those types of places impact you as an artist? What do you become when you're in those types of places playing? Well, the first thing you have to learn, because in those bars and clubs, you're competing with a lot of stuff, okay? First of all, you're competing with alcohol. Yep. Second of all, you're competing with every place I played had pool tables, they had pinball machines, they had dart tournaments going on. So you've got to find, people are distracted. They really could care less who's up there on stage. Background noise. Exactly. In cases, yeah. Exactly. It's background noise. So you've got to find a way to get those people's attention. Because I was up there with just an acoustic guitar and a drum machine, and that was it. And I went out. As a matter of fact, that amplifier right there, I bought that amplifier in 1984 because I realized I'm going to have to find out a way to get these people's attention. I bought that amplifier and that natural wood Stratocaster back See, there. Yep. I bought that in uh, 1984. In. And I bought, I found a 100-foot guitar cord. I didn't even know they made those <laughs> things. Found a 100-foot guitar cord. So I would start off the night playing acoustic guitar like normal. You know, I'm doing everything from George Jones to John Denver to uh, James Taylor, whatever was popular at the time, George Strait, whatever. But by the third set, <clears throat> that. And I'm running out on top of people's tabletops, kicking their beers and stuff over, and playing Johnny B. Good and, you know, stuff like that. You're going to watch me. Absolutely. You're going to pay attention. That's right. Hey. Yep. Here I am. Pay attention. And it worked. For whatever reason, it worked. And I learned so much. As much of a pain in the ass as those shows were back in the day, because, I mean, you don't have anybody. You know, it was just me. So I'm having to 
load all my gear in, load all my gear out. I'm my own sound man. I'm my own light guy. I had two light trees on either side of the stage that I owned. I'm having to do, I'm my own booking agent. I'm my own manager. I'm the one responsible for going out and getting all these things, making all these things happen. I'm responsible for making sure that I get paid at the end of the week. All these different things. That's all stuff that I learned. And as much of a pain as it was, I learned things from those experiences that I could have never learned anywhere else. And I still call on those things every single night. If you're on stage and something goes wrong, if you have never experienced that, if a microphone goes out or a guitar goes out or you break a string or whatever, back in those days, I learned how to keep the banter going and the, and the you know, keep people's attention, you know, even while you're working through these issues and this, that, and the other. And uh, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a great teaching lesson. Uh, I learned things from that that I still pull on from the, to this day. And I, as much of, of a pain as they were, I wouldn't give anything for any of those experiences. What, what made you go to Nashville? There was a guy um, that was playing at a little club that was down the street from me, a little bar actually, called Chico Dills in uh, Marietta. Chico Dills. Chico Dills. And it was right across the street from the high school that I uh, graduated from, Sprayberry High School. And um, it was probably less than a mile from my house. So I went in there one night when I was working for the heating and air conditioning company. And uh, I saw this guy up on stage with just a guitar and a drum machine. And I, I sat there and watched him and I listened to him and he was good. But uh, I thought to myself, man, I could do that job. So sure enough, I got to know him extremely well, and um, he found out that I was writing some songs and this, that, and the other. And he wanted he was getting ready to go to Nashville to record his first was he really? demo album. And he invited me to go with him because he wanted to use one of the songs that I had written. Actually, the first song I ever wrote, which was a song called Spend a Little Time. So he went to Nashville, took me with him, and I just was, man, being in a studio and all these professional people around. And I'm like, oh, yeah, man. This is what I, <laughs> this this is for me. What, this is what I want to do right here. And obviously it took several years. But um, I started, uh, I met a guy in Marietta by the name of Danny Davenport. And he, I didn't know it at the time that I met him. But he worked for Warner Brothers Records. He was a promotion man for Warner Brothers Records out of Atlanta. And so I walk in his room in his studio that he just had built. Um, and there's all these gold and platinum records on the wall from ZZ Top and Rod Stewart. Badass. That's and, good. and Madonna and Prince and all the, Hank Williams Jr. and all these other people. So he had some juice. Oh, he had some juice. So um, we recorded this. None of us knew how to hardly turn the machines on in this little studio. And it took us about 18 months to record this album that I just wanted to have something that I could sell at my gigs and use to promote. I had really no intention of trying to present it to a record label. As soon as it was done, he took those original tapes and flew to Burbank, California and said, he played it for the presidents and the CEOs of Warner Brothers out of Burbank, which was a guy by the name of Mo Austin and another guy by the name of Lenny Warnaker. And much to my surprise, they said, we want to sign this guy immediately. Wow. But he's obviously a country music artist, so take these tapes and fly back to Nashville and meet with the president of the country music division in Nashville, a guy by the name of Jim Ed Norman, and see what he has to say. And he passed on me. He didn't hear it. And so 
it went back to, I wasn't privy to the, I wasn't there for the conversation, but I heard from other people that were. Basically, the conversation went to, okay, the presence of Warner Brothers Burbank said, all right, if you're not going to sign this guy, we're going to sign him out here, and we're going to do the same thing with him that we did with Dwight Yoakam. We're going to put him out opening for ZZ Top and Los Lobos and some of these other people, and we're going to break him out of Burbank. And so Nashville, uh, with some reluctancy, signed me. And they signed me to a three singles deal, which meant they were going to release three singles. And after those three singles were done, if one of those didn't go top ten, I was over. So that's what brought me to Nashville in the, in the original days. All right, so to my knowledge, two of those three went to the tip of the spear. Correct? Well, actually, actually. What were, what were those singles? What? The first single was Country Club. That's what I thought. And it went barely top ten. It went number nine. But here's the key factor. I only had a three singles deal. So I had only recorded three songs for Warner Brothers. That was in um, 1989. 89, yeah. And I had recorded three singles because they're not going to give me an album. They're not re going to record an album on me if one of those three songs that I had recorded didn't go top ten. So I'm praying like crazy, man. <laughs> in August of 1989, please let this song, this first single, Country Club, go top ten. And my prayers were answered. Not only did it go top 10, but it became the largest selling single that Warner Brothers Country Music Division had ever released up to that point. And so that was the catalyst. Then we had to rush back into the studio and record the I'm rest of it. be the somebody? Help me hold on? Correct. I mean, good God. Drift it's, off to dream. It's just like that, that first album was so amazing. I can, and, and, and when it's that successful, immediately, and I know immediately is a relative term. Yes. But when, when you have that kind of commercial success that quickly, what does that do to your normal? Boy, it's like being strapped to a rocket ship. And, I mean, everything that, that goes on, it just happens so fast, or at least it did in my case. And, I mean, I went from playing these little dive clubs that probably held maybe 120 people at the most to all of a sudden playing bigger clubs and bigger places and being on festivals and all these different things and there's thousands of people that are coming out and, and they're interested in it. It was all the things that I ever dreamed of but it was it was shocking at the same time to me. I, I mean I in the back of my mind did I dream about it? Yes. Did I expect it to happen? Absolutely not. Absolutely. Absolutely not. Then how how does the how does the dream compare to when it's real life? What comes with real life that the dream doesn't tell you? I imagine it. You're a business. All of a sudden, yeah. your na tra the name Travis Tritt is a business. Exactly. And the the one thing that you find out very quickly, because I I think I never got into it for the money. I got into it because of my love of music. That's, that was the biggest driving factor. Music was so much a part of my life growing up, and it influenced me so much. It became the soundtrack of my life. I remember, I remember specific moments of my life, important moments. The first time I kissed a girl, first time I ever went on a date, first time I ever drove a car by myself. And Every one of those important things and many, many more, there was music playing in the background. I can tell you exactly what song mm -hmm. I was listening to when every one of those things happened. It becomes the soundtrack of your life. So all I wanted to do was just take that music and just, just pass it along. I didn't realize that if you become successful in the music industry, that you have to be able to become a business person, a businessman, at the same time. I used to say that if you're going to be in this business and be successful, you need to be able to carry a guitar case in one hand and a briefcase in the other and know how to use both of them extremely well. Because if you don't, you just kind of get tossed on this ocean without a compass. And uh, so... Once again, I had no earthly idea, and 
The other part that I didn't realize was that when you become that business, when Travis Tripp becomes a business, I'm that business, there's no 40 hours a week or 50 hours a week in that business. That business is 24-7, 365. And you just never know what's going to pop up. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten phone calls at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Hey, this just opened up. This slot just opened up on a major award show. Or this slot just opened up. Um, the headliner at this big festival just had to cancel. They want you to come in and, and take that headliner spot. Um, and no isn't an option. No, exactly not. I mean, you know, it's one of those things where absolutely you take all of that. And, and so the, the logistics of it, uh, the business side of it, was something that I had no earthly idea. It's worth it at the end of the day because once again you're getting to accomplish your uh, your ultimate goal which is to try to get your music out to as many people as you possibly can but if I had just been able to grasp what it was going to take and all the sacrifices that I was going to have to make in my personal life I remember the first two years that I was releasing records and getting my name out there the first two years I was home those two years for a total of 14 days each year, and no two days were ever together. Unbelievable. Because if you're not on tour, you're in the studio. If you're not in the studio, you're writing for a new album. If you're not writing for a new album, you're shooting a video, or you're doing interviews, or you're doing this and that, and it's just... And it's every single day at that point if you're trying to launch this rocket off the ground. I know you love it, but that's, that's pushing the line of love. Yeah. How close did you get to going? Um, I never really got to that point okay. I, because I just loved it so much. It's the same reason I love it now. I, I, you know, and, and the shock of the fact that I dreamed about all this stuff, but I didn't dream, even in my wildest dreams, did I imagine that all these things would happen for me mm -hmm. the way that they did. And you just kind of look around and you just go, wow. And now as I've gotten older, I look back over my career over the last 32 years, and I'm astonished at some of the cool stuff that I got to do. And like what? Is there anything that stick out? Playing with Ray Charles. Mm. Getting to know Johnny Cash and Waylon Jennings and Charlie Daniels and George Jones uh, and Charlie Pride and recording with these people. Not just knowing them, but record with them and play shows with them and uh, Doing, you know, movies and stuff like uh, Blues Brothers 2000, where I'm up on stage with all these great, great from every genre. And I'm the only country boy from country music up there. And I'm up there with Eric Clapton and, you know, Stevie Winwood and B.B. King. And you just ah, mind-blowing stuff, man. I would have never imagined this little kid from Marietta, Georgia, to be in that position. And, and when you, I know statistically, obviously coming out of the sporting world, I know you know, your chances, no matter how good you are. Grain of sand. Exactly. On a big, 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 big old damn big beach. Beach, exactly. Your chances of making it, and the same thing in music. It's, your chances are minimal. My dad used to say all the time, he said, son, you got a better chance of being president of the United States than you do of being <laughs> successful in the music world. And in a lot of ways, he was absolutely right. So to look back over it now and realize for whatever reason that all that stuff happened for me, uh, timing had a lot to do with it. Uh, the people that I knew I had connections with, 
um, had a lot to do with it. Um, it was just, it was just not only a lot of great stuff that happened, but a, a, a lot of great stuff that happened, in my opinion, at one of the greatest times that it could have happened. You and I have known each other for a while now, and you know how I feel about the 90s. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, you're talking about the soundtrack of your youth and knowing yes. this song when I kissed that girl, yes. this song when I got in daddy's car and cranked it myself for the yes. first time, yes. same way. Yes. And you're, it's, I mean, it's you and it's Clint Black and it's Brooks and Dunn and it's Garth Brooks and it's Tracy Lawrence and yes. it's those yes. folks that are that for me. And then of yeah. course it's the hip hop side and then you got sure. Def Leppard and Bon sure. Jovi and all sure. them too. Sure, absolutely. What's it like when you, when you meet somebody my age, mid forties, who tells you that? You are that soundtrack. It's, it's, it's humbling. It's astonishing to me because even though that was my initial goal is to try to get my music out, try to move people with the music as much as I had been moved by music when I was that age. Um, it's, it's just, you realize, I, you don't realize when you're in the middle of it, it's like being in the center of a hurricane. You don't really realize how much you're affecting people around you and how far that reaches out. I was just in the process of um, writing. I just did a, a new album. It's first Set in Stone. Yes. Comes out May 7th. Yes, that's correct. Y'all make sure to get it. It's the first new studio album that I've done in 13 years. And uh, when I was talking with Dave Cobb, who produced it for me, I was talking with him about doing the album. He said, well, he said, before we get into agreeing to do this album, he said, I want to hook you up with some of my favorite songwriters. And all these guys are young. You know, Brent Cobb, Adam Hood, you know. Channing. Channing, Wilson, all these guys. They're younger. <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm like, yeah, man, that's, that sounds great. It was a little bit intimidating because I know that these guys are extremely good at what they do. But, and I'm a, a lot older than them. But uh, I was also excited about that opportunity. But the one thing that came out of every single one of those writing sessions was that these guys came in and t they started telling me, man, we grew up on you. No doubt. We grew up on your music. We grew up, you know, listening to your stuff on the radio and going, holy shit, man, that's, that's, that's our lives, right? That guy's singing about us. And then some of them talked about going to my concerts and this, that, and the other. And that's, that, it, you know, I started blushing and, you know, because you I don't can realize. See, uh, it, it's, sometimes it's hard to, to accept praise it as, is. as humans and, and people who understand their blessings and, and have a faith-based compass and all those things. Sometimes it's hard to accept that type of accolade or that type of appreciation. But I'm here to tell you, man, it's the truth. I'm with those guys. Because, oh, I mean, the, those songs, Travis, those songs are iconic and they're forever and they're part, they're not just something that we, that we hear and go, oh yeah, I remember that. They're yeah. something that we seek out, we put on in our special times now because they are this conduit to that sector of our life. Right. And we've carried it with us. And, and that's a hell of a legacy. Well, it's, you know, it, it amazes nobody more than me. Because once again, I mean, I, you know, I wanted, I wanted to have a successful career. And I wanted to have more than that. I wanted to have a, a career that had some longevity to it. But I never dreamed that all these big things would be happening for me. I mean, you know, I knew a lot of people, I still do, that are a whole hell of a lot more talented than I am. I say it every they're day. better singers, they're better songwriters, they're better musicians, and most of the world will never know their names. And why in the world that happened to me, I almost feel guilty about it sometimes, to be honest. I feel guilty about it. But, because, but why? Why do you feel guilty? Because I don't feel... I, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. I don't, you know, if you know that there's a bunch of people, I, I play with guys at bluegrass festivals and I've written songs with guys that I thought 
were a whole lot more talented than I was and still do. And for whatever reason, some of them had, you know, a modicum of success. As far as the overall thing, they never reached the levels that, that we were able to reach and all of my compadres that were coming out around that same time. I, you know, and I, I, don't, I don't feel worthy of that. I don't, I just never have. And that's the difficult part for me because I was just trying to go out and just make music, man, and, and move people the way I was moved. And to have it happen the way that it happened in such a big form, nobody was more shocked by that than me. You're talking about Set in Stone, your new record coming out here in, in May. Uh, what's the difference in writing a record at this stage in your life versus writing a record when you were a younger man? I don't think it, there's really that much difference. I'm one of those guys from, from a songwriter standpoint. I'm not one of those people that writes all the time. I never have been. Uh, the way I always did it when I was first getting started is... Of course, there's an old saying in our business that you have your entire lifetime to write that first record. You have three, Ten mo minutes. three months to <laughs> yeah. write the second album. Yep. So from that point on, after we recorded that first album, it was always tour, 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 write, 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 studio, 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 record, record, record. And it would move from one thing to the next. And I'm very... I have blinders on. I, I, I can't focus on 15 things at once. I just can't. If I'm in road mode, touring mode, I'm focused on giving the best possible performance that I can every single night, and that's the only thing I care about. If I'm in writing mode, it's writing for the, for the new album, writing the best material that I can possibly write, or finding the best material that I can find outside of my own writing for the upcoming album. So in preparation, I mean, to me, songwriting is about conveying things that are so about your life so that you can, hopefully, other people can relate to that. Dan Fogelberg had one of the greatest quotes, and I've used it throughout my entire career, one of the greatest quotes. He said, I write songs with this in the back of my head. I try to move myself honestly and objectively. I try to move myself because I know that if I can truly and honestly move myself, I can move other people. Yep. So that's what I try to do. I try to find the things that are so about my life, how you feel about your social status, how you feel about your job, how you feel about your country, how you feel about the person you're in love with or breaking up with or whoever it may be, how you feel about your family, um, all those different aspects that are part of every single one of our lives and try to find something in there. Well, I feel this way about this. I wonder if there's other people out there that feel the same thing. I bet there is. And then try to write something that connects to that. And that's always been the, that was, it was the way, that way back in the early days and it's still that way for me now. So I had uh, chatted with you before and you told me something I found to be fascinating. I'd like to revisit it, that there was this moment in time where you were getting a little bit of grief, getting a little bit of criticism for the way that you were operating and you ran into Waylon. Yeah. Well, walk me through that story and the impact of what he said. Well, I, I, was, I was doing great at the beginning of the career uh, with Country Club, Help Me Hold On, I'm Going to Be Somebody. Those songs were monsters, all, all big, and they fit right into the country music format. Everything was great. And then I got up to, uh, I wanted to release Put Some Drive in Your Country as a single, and it had all these rock guitars on it and this, that, and the other. And man, I started getting grief. I started getting it first from radio, and then I started getting it from the establishment in Nashville, record label, this, that, and the other. And I was just adamant that, look, I'm not trying to make any kind of a statement here. I'm just trying to show you the influences that I had that were outside of traditional country music when I was growing up, but 
just as much a part of me as anything else that I've ever done. And I was just adamant that I wanted to make sure that I got that stuff out there in front of the audience because that's just as much a part of me as any other part. And I started getting all this pushback. Well, he must be difficult to work with or he's insisting on doing things his own way. He doesn't want to go along with us. He's not a team player. And uh, frankly, there were some that just came right out and said it. Uh, he must be an asshole. And um, then they came out with the outlaw. He's an outlaw. He's a nonconformist. He's a... He's an outlaw. He's a renegade. He's a rebel. He's an outlaw. And the negative, they weren't saying it in a nice way. It was very negative. And I started, man, I mean, I'd pick up a magazine or I would hear on the radio, hear some disc jockey talking about it or uh, hear somebody in the industry talk about it. And it was like, man, I just don't get it, you know? All I'm wanting to do is just do it my own way. And it was starting to get depressing for me. I was it was it was hurting my feelings, to be honest. And when I met Waylon Jennings, met him in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Omni in Atlanta, we were doing a show together. And we came into his dressing room and we took pictures and met him and just told him how much I admired him and how much of a of an influence he'd been on me. And, so my little group, we're getting ready to walk out, and I'm the last one, and I'm to the door. I've got my hand on the doorknob. And Waylon said, hey, Hoss. Talking to me? Yeah, come here, man. I want to talk to you. And he brought me back in by myself, and he said, sit down in that chair. I want to talk to you for a minute. He said, I've been hearing everything that they've been saying about you in the press and radio and in Nashville. He said, let me just tell you something. Everything that they are saying about you is exactly the same things that they said about me and about Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash and Hank Williams Jr. and Chris Christopherson and he just went down the list. He said, let me ask you a question. He said, you still selling records? I said, yes, sir. Every single one of them is selling extremely well. He said, people still coming to see your shows? I said, yes, sir, they are. It's packed every night. He said, that's all that matters. He said, that's who you're doing it for. He said, these people in Nashville, he said, the people at radio stations and these people at the record labels and these people that write for these country music ma magazines, he said, they get their music for free. Mm. For free. He said, the people that should matter to you are those people that go out there and work 40 and 50 and 60 hours a week hard to earn that living to put food on the table for their families, and they're willing to spend a certain amount of that money to go out and buy your music and occasionally go out and buy a concert ticket if you come to town. He said, that's who you play for. He said, those other people, pay no attention to them. That's not who you're playing for. That's not who you're doing this for. You're doing it for them. And it was like <clears throat> mind-blowing. Was that a big weight off? Oh, huge, yeah. huge because he was exactly right. The more I thought about what he told me, the more it made absolute sense. And then I got it reinforced from Charlie Daniels and other people who told me exactly the same thing. And it was like, don't pay attention to that, man. It doesn't matter. You know who you are. You know that you're none of those things that they say you are. And that they're trying to transfer, somehow or another, they're trying to transfer this perception into the reality of who you really are. And that's totally not the case. But you know who you are. You know that you're not any of those things. That you're just trying to do music the best way you possibly can and the only way you know how to do it. And that's your way. And just stay on that path, man. As long as the audience is responding the way that they are, that's all that matters to me. And it did. It lifted a huge weight off my shoulders. God bless Waylon Jennings. Yeah, absolutely. That day in Georgia with Travis and his family at their ranch will forever be very special to me and to my crew. Uh, we went down there and, and again, spent an entire day 
with Travis and his family. And they were so gracious to us, welcomed us into their home. And we had that fantastic conversation that you just heard, but trust me, you didn't hear it all. There was much more that we got on tape, on film, that hopefully you guys will have the opportunity to see at a later time. But to get to sit down with him for 45 minutes or an hour and talk about that path from all those dreams to reality to when you get to reality, sometimes reality wasn't what the dream looked like. And all that talent and the immediate success of Country Club for us on the outside who are just super fans, we go, everything must be absolutely a dream. And then you realize there's a lot of politics and a lot of obstacles that artists face that we don't know about. And so I, I'm really grateful for Travis and his candor and his honesty and vulnerability and sharing that with me. And I just want to say, again, as I said off the top of the show, he's somebody who's really important to me. We met at the Kentucky Derby a few years back. Uh, we have a mutual friend, and Travis was at the same restaurant that I was at. He and I have a mutual friend. His name is Jeff Ruby. He owns a bunch of steakhouses, has one in Louisville, has one in Columbus, and several across the country. And Travis came over to say hello to a mutual friend of ours. And I was sitting at the same table, and man, was I starstruck. I didn't know what to do. I, I just don't say a word. And he reached out his hand and said hello and shook my hand, and a friendship blossomed right there that has been more than my, I mean, it's, it's beyond my comprehension that I can call him a friend. So my, my gratitude to him and, and everybody in his family for welcoming us in is, is beyond description. So thank you to Travis. I love what he said there, back to the obstacles. I love what he said about the fact that you're playing for the fans. You're playing for the people that open up their wallet who are working 412s at the factory and take the time to come see you when you come to town and take the time to buy your record when you put a new one out. I love every bit of that. It took a guy like Waylon, the GOAT, for that to really be driven home for Travis. And I just find that to be a beautiful message. And, and a lot of us in entertainment can glean something from that because that's who we're doing it for. We're doing it for you guys. And I am so grateful to every one of you who take the time to listen to the road you leave behind, who invest in us here at Outsider Media. Please subscribe, rate, and review the road you leave behind. It matters so much to our company. And we're so giddy to get to do this because we love country music so much, just like you guys do. Thank you. Go buy Travis's record. Again, it's called Set in Stone, out everywhere, May 7th. Stream it, buy it, go to Walmart and get a CD. What, however it is that you consume your music these days, Spotify, Apple Music, whatever that is, Set in Stone. Support Travis. This record is quintessential Travis Tripp. It's fantastic. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for your passion for country music. Thank you for your support and passion for Outsider. I'm Marty Smith. We'll see you next time around.